monocyte even encounters that antigen, the antigen becomes bind to the receptors. This binding is the physiochemical meaning of the word recognize in immunology. Accordingly, the ability of lymphocytes to distinguish one antigen from another is determined by the nature of their plasma membrane receptors. Each lymphocyte is specific for just one type of antigen and it is estimated that in a typical person the lymphocyte population expresses more than 100 million distinct antigen receptors. We do not mean to imply that every lymphocyte is different from every other one. In most cases, a single type of antigen receptor may be expressed by a small number of lymphocytes, termed a clone. Thus, there are more than 100 million distinct small clones of lymphocytes in the body. The binding of antigen to the receptor in an absolute environment is required for the lymphocyte activation. Upon binding to an antigen, the lymphocyte undergoes a cell division and the two resulting daughter cells then also divide, even though only one of them still has the antigen attached to it and so on. In other words, the original binding of antigen by a single lymphocyte specific for that antigen triggers multiple cycles of cell divisions. As a result, many lymphocytes are formed that are identical to the one that started the cycle and can recognize the antigen that is termed clonal expansion. After activation, two of the lymphocyte types, B cells and cytotoxic T cells, then function as effector lymphocytes which carry out the attack response. A third type of lymphocyte called helper T cell after activation secretes cytokines that enhance the activation and function of B cells and cytotoxic T cells. The activated effector lymphocytes launch and attack against all antigens of the kind that initiated the immune response. Theoretically, it takes only one of the two antigen molecules to initiate the specific immune response that will then result in an attack on all of the other antigens of that specific kind in the body. Activated B cells differentiate into plasma cells which secrete antibodies into the blood and these antibodies then recruit and guide other molecules and cells to perform the actual attack. In contrast, activated cytotoxic T cells directly attack and kill the cells bearing the antigens. Once the attack is successfully completed, the great majority of the B cells, plasma cells, helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells that participated in it die by apoptosis. The timely death of these cells is a homeostatic response that prevents the immune defense from becoming excessive. However, there are certain types of cells which still remain and these are called memory cells which are ready to respond at some future time when the antigen reappears. Now we are going to discuss about lymphoid organs and lymphocyte origins. Our first task is to describe the organs and tissues in which lymphocytes originate and come to reside. Then we will describe the various types of lymphocytes. Lymphoid organs like all leukocytes, lymphocytes circulate in the blood. At any moment, the great majority of lymphocytes are not actually in the blood. However, but in a group of organs and tissues, collectively termed the lymphoid organs. These are subdivided into primary lymphoid organs and secondary lymphoid organs. 
we will first see the primary lymphoid organs. These are bone marrow and thymus. These organs supply the secondary lymphoid organs with mature lymphocytes. That is lymphocytes which are already programmed to perform their functions when activated by antigen. The secondary lymphoid organs are the lymph nodes, spleen, tonsils and lymphocyte accumulations in the linings of the intestinal tract, respiratory tract, genital tract and urinary tract. It is in the secondary lymphoid organs that lymphocytes are activated to participate in specific immune responses. As I have already stated that the bone marrow and thymus supply mature lymphocytes to the secondary lymphoid organs. Most of the lymphocytes in the secondary organs are not, however, the cells that originated in the primary lymphoid organs. Once in the secondary lymphoid organ, a mature lymphocyte coming from the bone marrow or the thymus can undergo cell division to produce additional identical lymphocytes which in turn undergo cell division and so on. In other words, all lymphocytes are descendant from ancestors that matured in the bone marrow or thymus but may not themselves have arisen in those organs. As I have mentioned earlier, all the progeny cells which are derived they finally constitute a lymphocyte clone. There are no anatomical links other than the cardiovascular system between various lymphoid organs. Let us look briefly at these organs. First, lymphoid tissues. Lymphoid tissues are the connective tissues dominated by lymphocytes. In a lymphoid nodule or lymphatic nodule, the lymphocytes are densely packed in an area of areolar tissue. In many areas, lymphoid nodules form large clusters. Lymphoid nodules occur in the connective tissue deep in the epithelial lining of the respiratory tract where they are known as tonsils and even along the digestive tract and urinary tract. They are also found within more complex lymphoid organs such as lymph nodes or spleen. A single nodule averages about a millimeter in diameter but the boundaries are not distinct because no fibrous capsule surrounds them. Each nodule often has a central zone called germinal center which contains dividing lymphocytes. Now we will discuss MALT, M-A-L-T, that is mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. The collection of lymphoid tissues linked with the digestive system is called MALT. Clusters of lymphoid nodules deep to the epithelial lining of the ileum of small intestine are known as aggregated lymphoid nodules or pierce patches. In addition, the wall of the appendix or vermiform appendix, which is a blind pouch that originates from the junction between the small and the large intestine, contains masses of fused lymphoid nodules. Tonsils Tonsils are large lymphoid nodules in the walls of the pharynx. Most people have five tonsils. Left and right palatine tonsils are located at the posterior, inferior margins of the oral cavity along the boundary with the pharynx. A single pharyngeal tonsil, often called adenoid, lies in the posterior superior wall of the nasopharynx and a pair of lingual tonsils lie deep to the mucous epithelium covering the base that is pharyngeal portion of the tongue. Because of their location the latter are usually not visible unless they become infected and swollen a condition known as tonsillitis. Surgical removal of the tonsils is called tonsillectomy.